Okay, say something again, Curtis. So we were just part of the United Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Curtis Hill, and I am the, the Agriculture Extension Agent for the South Carolina State University 1890 Extension Program. I cover the peak of my region, and I would like to welcome you to our livestock management workshop, and thank you for, our, for your attendance this morning. I would like to briefly recognize the agencies, institutions, and organizations who made it possible for this event to occur this morning. They are uh, Fort Valley State University, the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, the Piedmont Farmers Market Cooperative, and Clemson University Livestock Culture and Health Division. We have a great lineup of speakers ready to share their knowledge with you. And without further delay, our first speaker is a recent addition to the 1890 Extension Family, and he is the state program leader for sustainable agriculture, natural resources, and environment. And he is Dr. Joshua Adasi, and his presentation will be entitled Silver Pastor, Dr. Adasi.
Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, as a new kid in town, I have to speak a little bit loud. And you can guess the accent. I think I'm from Mississippi. Do you think so? <laughs> from Alabama? From South Carolina? From Georgia? No, 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 no. I was born in Tanzania. Can you say Tanzania? Can you say Kilimanjaro? That's where I was born. My mother is a coffee grower and we grew coffee when I was little. So farming has been in our blood. So coffee farming was what made me go to school. They sold the coffee, we got the money, we paid the tuition. Way back. And this is a little story, you know, I have a story to tell. Before I went to high school, there was an American preacher. My brother is a bishop, every bishop back in Tanzania. His name is Stephen. So Stephen and this guy Christopher, they came to our farm. Christopher is a white Lutheran preacher from Iowa. He came to Tanzania, so he was in our house. And in the morning, we were called to go to do some coffee picking and coffee chores. And Christopher said, Steve, that's my brother. I wish one of your brothers can come to the US and you know, tell the story about what you guys are doing. Guess what? I said, me, 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 I'm doing it. This was 64, around you know, the year after JFK died. You can know, guess how old they are. So I said, me, 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 and here I am talking to you today. So there's a little connection about my talk today. Silvo pasta is what we did back in Tanzania, growing coffee. Why I say that? When we were growing coffee, the cows, which we held in our, what do you call, zero grazing status, we didn't take our cows anywhere, we fed them. They were there in that house hole and we fed them day and night by cutting grass, bringing in some, you know, supplemental feeding and they gave us manure. The same manure was taken to the coffee. Coffee grew very well when everything is manure. And then we added some fruit trees. We had avocado, we had avocado, I know from Mexico, but we have avocado from Tanzania. And then bananas. Bananas were a very mix with coffee. So avocado, bananas, and guavas, uh, and some other tropical fruits were grown with the coffee. So the type of mixing of trees and your cash crop, which was coffee, and then you have the cows, because manure is what is really called silvo pasta. So simple pasta is a combination of the three. And if you can see in the picture, which I've shown you, you can see how it is, the cows under the shadow trees eating porridge, which could be any type of grass which you, you, you establish. Dr. Novo, later on, he will give us a little bit more about those forage, how they can help the animal gain weight. And, and many other things which we'll uh, hear from Mr. Noble will kind of ex exemplify or edify what I'm saying. What I'm trying to tell you today is an introduction of something to come. We will have other seminars on Silver Pastor because this will be kind of a series. One, two, three, how to establish a Silver Pastor project in your farm if you want to how you can maintain your simple posture. You know why? You have three things. The trees, the livestock, and the forest. These are very interesting uh, products which need some very interesting and careful care maintenance. Are you there with me? So, simple posture is a combination of trees, livestock, and forage, and as you can see on the picture there. So there's a definition there. I will not say a lot about it. I just mentioned about it. The key thing is what I want you to understand. In everything we do, we have a way we use systems, forage system, 
and the timber system, and then we have the livestock system. All these systems put together bring what we call simple cost. And there's some uh, scientific way of doing a lot of these uh, systems, but as a rule of thumb, as you found, you know what your livestock needs, they need food. And it could be, as I said earlier, supplemental kind of a food where you give them some grains. But these days, there's this thing we say uh, grass fed meats are the ones which are really selling well in the market because people are really running away from many issues which are causing illness. So, grass fed meats are one good marketing, I can say, uh, ploy to tell people that, hey, my beef, they are what? Coming from grass fed. So, silver wash, I can give you some good uh, uh, kind of a training of that. Of course, you as livestock uh, producers, you know much about what we're talking about here. But as I say, because we're talking about mixing three things together, this way we'll bring some more training on that a little bit later. Why do landowners love silver pasta? As I said, there's a lot of reasons. But what I really want to do is to hit on just this first one, the third one. And uh, I'll hear number eight. Let me start with number eight. Number eight is a very important kind of a point. Dr. Novo will speak about it a little bit later. Shape. Our cows, the black angus beef cows or cows, they love shape. The red angus beef, they like shape. Even them goats love shape too when they are. Uh, Full and they drink some water, don't go under the shade. Yeah. But for goats, they start debarking the tree. Goats are something else. They also eat in the parts of the tree. So, most of the time, we are, we are trying to make goats a little bit secure, a, a little bit secure so that they don't uh, uh, eat the parts of the tree. But they are saying shade is very important because of the heat. This summer, we might have heat going up to 100 degrees. We don't want our animals to be stressed. So having trees around your uh, graze, grazing kind of fields is a, is a very good thing. Simple pasture will bring that to the table to, the, to your knowledge so that we can combine our trees and our livestock so that they can be stress-free. Number one, diversification. We really want the trees in forage. You can sell hay. Bale, make a little bit of money. Beef, you can sell them uh, cows and make some money. And then you can wait for the trees to, to grow. And then when they're mature, you can sell, you know, cut for power, for timber, so that you can have your grandchildren go to college. So timber is a long-term investment when we talk about simple pasture. So, Short term will be your forage, your hay. Short term will be your cattle. But long term will be your trees. I, 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 are we there? Are we there together? Three things. Trees are your long term investment. Forage is your short term investment. And your cattle are short term investment. But this is a kicker. It gives you this tool. The short term investment, they give you a stream of income while you're waiting for your trees to grow. I always say, leave the trees for your children and their children while you're making a little bit of money with your livestock. And hey, we'll talk a lot of, about silver fossil because this, this is my area. I'm a forester by background. So in agriculture, I combine agriculture and forestry and bring a name called agroforestry. So you will hear a lot about this, this theme of the forest as we, we are here with Caris, we'll make some more training. And we have Tyrone from, uh, from uh, Anderson County, and, and it's your neighbor, and we will do some more training that way too, because I know there are some people who are also producing. Now, providing wildlife habitat, that's an interesting one. Your deers and all other good stuff which come around the 
those uh, trees, you'll use them whenever the season comes for hunting those wildlife, you'll do it. So, later on, they're doing this because of those 10 reasons. There could be a lot of other reasons. And the last one is here. It's an opportunity for what? Recreational activities. A lot of people like camping. Our young people like camping. A simple pasture kind of a project will give you a very aesthetic kind of a provision that could be even good for some people to do some celebration. I had a friend who did a wedding in a simple pasture kind of establishment. It was really beautiful because the pictures which came out of that wedding were super. The trees, you know, it's the old green. It was a very nice time of the year when it was not that much, you know, the, 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 the forage is not turning to kind of a grayish or brownish. So the, the colors were so beautiful. That's an introduction to something which is coming. Now, you have seen this before. You have, you have quails and deers, you know, growing in the field. When you have been simple pasture, you will have a very good thing which will come. Quails can be raised widely, and even you can have uh, turkeys. And then you can have our uh, beef deers, the, the white tail deers, you know, they are, they'll be running here. The only kicker is with deers, we do have ticks. You all know about ticks. You know how it will be an issue when you get bitten and we, you don't know, and then you start feeling that type of feverish and feverish experience. But what we are saying is this we will have animals go through. And most of the time, the, the deer ticks will go to the animals, and we can really get to clean up our animals when we see those ticks on the animal very easily. I'm not talking about the negative things here, but I just, I'm just telling you, whenever well is involved, there's some good and bad. Ticks will show up. But the key thing is, we will harvest when the season comes with deers and also uh, the, the, the quail. And, Tops, if, if it is possible. Uh, water issues are quite very important in many of our communities. If we do have a water source, like a creek, we want it to be clean. What kind of the water? We could have fish. And with recreation, this is a lot of our guys, the retirees, we do go to our rivers and fish. And we want those rivers to be clean so that we don't have contamination. Take home good fishes for us to, to eat without getting diseases. A lot of issues in the mountain in North Carolina and this uh, Tennessee, where when they had a power mill up there, that messed up the rivers and the people got uh, the oxen to fish, they harvest and let the oxen went to their system and we had a lot of colon cancer, prostate cancer, and quite a lot of people died. Back in the day, I don't know whether you remember Al Gore. Al Gore was running for president and he was asked about this thing. Pigeon River is contaminated. What are you going to do about it? And of course politics by then it was something else. But now that river is clean, people are fishing again. Are you there with me? We can, we can have clean water because of uh, silver foster. Now, look good, aesthetic increases. As I say, silver foster makes the place look really good. It can even help to appreciate the value of your property because of how it looks. The appraisers will come and say, look at that, what is that? That looks so beautiful. And that, for, for sure, will, will help in putting some trading on whatever value we have. Now, just quickly, I, I need to finish because the, the really good stuff are coming after me. In simple pasta, we need to establish your trees first. And in, when you're doing that, you grow them in some form of rows or lines with some spacing. My project I did when I was at AT, North Carolina, is in Wayne County, in an uh, area called Goldsboro. They are in Bristol. North Carolina AMT and North Carolina State and the state uh, 
development to agriculture, they have a property that it goes for. So 20 acre of is high in silver pasture standard. We started like this. Started with uh, growing the trees in some spacing, eight by eight, 10 by eight, and then uh, 10 by 12, and then 12 feet by 12. When I say those are spacing, the trees they have been doing really good so far. They are almost now 20 feet up there. We did some pruning. They look pretty good. The animals are having fun. And you see, we can even have as well hay bales. And by doing that, you're selling this or you're feeding to animals, you're cutting costs. And this is how it looks like. Can you, can, can you see? Let's see your simple pastor kind of a thing. It looks beautiful. And I don't know that if the will touch it. When you establish your foreigners, the cold season will end. Right now, this is warm season. Your, cold, your warm season. Uh, switchgrass, you know, Baha'i, Indian, uh, Eastern, uh, what do they call it? Eastern, Eastern what? Dr. Noble. The, the warm season grasses, you know, Eastern stem. Eastern gallery. Yeah, Eastern gallery. So, so these will come around this time, those really jumps start, and then by me, June, July, oh my goodness, they take over the place. And then this way you can bring your cows in and they will have fun. Now, sometimes we do add some sweet stuff, like sweet sorghum. It's added to the mix. And you know, sweet so sorghum is like sugar cane. Sugar cane is sweet. So they're eating sweet grass and they are normal grass and they have fun. And uh, I, I, I saw a group in uh, one of our southern states, they had a group called Amazing Grazing. Remember Amazing Grace? They put a grace, grazing event. So, in the night, they bring the animals to enjoy sweet soil. So, this animal will eat the whole plot of sweet soil up in the night, but they, they break up. The place is clean. Why? Because it's sweet. When they do like that, they go, they can have sweet under the shade of the trees. So, there's some really good way we can work. Manipulate our animals and uh, make them, you know, gain weight by what we do. So this is how it looks, and it looks really great. beautiful. When you have established a forest, it will take a few uh, iterations to come up to that. But for one season, I think it takes almost like three seasons to get established very well. And of course, you are your, you know, whole season grasses. We'll always stay around this time of the year. We are almost gone. Yeah, let me let me finish by saying this. There are some principles we'll have to follow during civil posture. It will be a learning process. A few of you who will be interested uh, will tell Curtis, tell him, and I will be there with you. I'll find also our local area foresters. So that we can decide what type of uh, tree species would be good for you. I know a young one with a lot of pine because it grows very fast, but you might want that one with pine, or you might even want to mix it up with some hardwoods, you know, yellow poplars, and I don't know, whatever you have in mind. Guess what? How many ladies do we have here? Can, can you raise up your hand, ladies? Ladies. Raise up your hands. I'm always making fun, but this is my kind of a closing. How do you pronounce pecan or pecan? Let's start off with that. What do you, how do you pronounce it? <coughs> yeah, like that. How do you pronounce it? Pecan or pecan? Pecan. Pecan. How about you, Doc? Pecan. Pecan. Yeah. Pecan. So I, this is what I want to finish with you. We can even introduce pecan to the mix. And you know what you get from pecan? You get nuts. Now a pound of nuts is $9.99. Are you there with me? And if you work, you put in away, organic pecan is $15. Are you there with me? You can start thinking about it because now we have grafted pecan trees. In five years, it gives you nuts. 
I have pictures of the because I drew them, and they are now really giving nuts and people are having fun. And you make money out of it. Now, they can also be shaped the animals while they are growing. You can clone them to fit the environment. Guys, I have to stop there because as I said, we have a good lineup of speakers ahead of me. This is an introduction. You've got the accent. It's from Canada. Can you say Kilimanjaro again? Say Kilimanjaro. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lagasse, for that uh, informative presentation. Switching. Switching. And next up, we have Dr. Ralph Noble, who is the Dean for the College of, College of Agriculture at Fort Valley State University in Fort Valley, Georgia. Dr. Noble. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Oh. Very glad to be here for a number of reasons. Really, uh, I'm reaching out as dean of the college at Fort Dallas to really start us working together on some ethics. Uh, some of the problems you had that small farmers here are very common. What's uncommon is how we resolve them, how we answer them, how we address them. And that's what I'm here to talk about. We can talk about livestock management. If you don't do it, if you don't make your money, you're going to do it all. So, one of the things we can do in that that really makes us more money. And so as a person who spent a number of years at Tuskegee University, after that, some nice years at North Carolina A&T, I've only been in Georgia for a couple of years. When I talk to farmers, even talk to some of you this morning, I hear the same problem. And we want to talk about resolving that. But we get a little older, we're going to get a sense of where are we the small farmers? You know, both us and our large universities, in this case, we say, Clemson, we all want to be kind of farmers, but we don't have the same small beef cattle owners. And this is the lens I'm speaking from as I talk to you to get a sense of my agenda that I'm going to talk about today. So this is from experience visiting farmers from Delaware, 1890s, Delaware City. All around the text is great, because there's a lot of farmers. And it's good to see you. But I really want to know how to solve your problem. You're doing real well, your problem doesn't seem long. When you're having trouble, we get paid to solve problems. So a nice and a program here, Fort Valley and the rest of the school. We get money when the farmers are having some issues. When anybody's doing well, money comes from the industries. When there's challenges there, they come from the schools. So this is where I'm getting about. And this is talking about beef cattle today, because we hear a lot about those. Then normally we consider small farmers. We may be part-time. We don't spend a lot of time there. We're getting older. The average population in America, I think, is at 68. Among black farmers, is older than that. And although I do see some young folks here with us today, they, their mind is on something else. We have to drag them and make them really feel a part of this. But they will inherit what we have. And if we don't adjust them right, they're going to be in the land and your farm will be them all. So we must make the farm do better. They must see it. They must see the farm doing well. So if they don't see it well, when we're going, they may get some flowers on the grave, but that farm is gone. That's a bad tree. We don't like that. And it's happening across the country. So let's be sure South Carolina and Georgia are part of the tree. So a lot of times we're part-time, we don't spend all our time here. So when it requires me to take us away from other jobs, we may not show up to that. We got to consider that. The farm makes us money, have an event where we take our time into another challenge. And then an advantage is that we have animals that are grazers, that utilize the grass. And because beef is an is a animal that's present in all 50 states in the country, we have an advantage that we have a long growing season. For the most part, we look at the price of raising cattle for the cost you. Notice we can nutrition and feed them is what costs the most money. The minute we go into the winter season, like I start feeding hay, like I start driving the truck, going to the southern states, the price of my cattle and how much money fit goes up and up. So this is the way I want to look at this. Normally speaking, we're going to say for every dollar a housewife spends for hamburger in the store, the farmer is 25 cents. So 75 cents goes somewhere else. I want to talk about how can we, the same diet, we can't make the animal that meat more expensive. We got to produce it at a cheaper rate. I want to be able to make that one dollar animal for 50 cents. And I want to be spending 75 cents, 80 cents trying to make the same dollar. If you try to raise the price of meat, they go buy some pork, they go buy some chicken. So we must be considered a what we call consumer driven. 
Consumers will buy what they like. So you may like what you want. If you're trying to make money, you must like what they want. And if you produce that product for them, they'll be even money for it. But not because you like it. We must listen to them. We must get information from them. And then judge what we're going to do better than our heart. And if you're happy being lazy and not doing much, then you keep on going. If I think I can do better, and you guys people don't want to reach out and help, like we are here today, then we're going to be this way. What's another problem we have? Labor shortage is tight. We probably talk a little about green kids when you're our kids. Our kids are going to school, a lot of cases that go away from here. It's the green kids that find animals interesting. We got to make a mistake, make a life, and the green has to come back. But in some cases, we have to improve the quality of what we sell, not what we want. Because the one thing, cattle were farmer driven. Whatever you produce, whatever you produce, don't get to buy it. Now they got options. And they go where they want to go. So you must make them happy. Otherwise, they're going to buy yours. And then there must be a, a challenge on the quantity. As small farmers sell the beef cattle, and the same animals the big farmers do. There's a different price for the big farmer. We didn't know that market out there is. The cheapest way and the lowest way in the apartment is what most of us do take it to the stock. And when they sell one by one by one by one, you get the lowest way you can get. When you can sell a group, we're going to call them lots. 10, 20 a lot, you can get between 25 and 50 cents more per pound. You got to do it as a group, you can't do it by yourself. You got to do it in a large lot. And we're going to talk about something we're trying to do in Georgia. I want to be South Carolina with the poles. We're trying to move a truckload. That's about 50,000 pounds of animals. So it may be 100, 500 pounds of animals. But the kids must look alike. They got to look like when they come to a particular farm or drop off. It must look like they cannot tell which farm it came from. It must all look alike. So we must agree on breeding, feeding, herd health, deworming, vaccination, so they look like peas in a pot. And now they're going to come to your place with a different. Your animals most likely will not go to the stockyard. They come to the farm and buy. Okay, so that's bureaucracy green opinion, that's gas pricing opinion, that's some things we can benefit from. That, remember, the hammer still costs a dollar. I'm trying to get it down to 50 cents, 40 cents, 30 cents. If I don't do it right, I'm spending 60 cents, 70 cents, 80 cents. I don't want to spend 90 cents trying to make a dollar. Go sell some flowers. Go do something else. But capitalism may not introduce you to it that way. And the need for market options. But there's not a lot of options for the small farmers with variable breeding season, variable size scale. We must agree on some things. And that's what this is going to come about. And I'm going to move to something. I'm going to move a little quicker because I want some answers to questions for us. But we're going to talk about types of farms. And for the most part, as I mentioned to us here in the movie there, we're doing what we call cow calf operation. We maintain our farm by breeding group of cows. They have babies, and that baby comes once a year. They're checking that baby, we must pay for that cow for the entire 365 days. The dewormer, hay, pasture, fencing, it must come from that same one day. They can't be doing it, either that cow is wrong, or we look at the mirror, we're doing it wrong. Let's find out how to do that a little better. We, I don't see them ever doing query rate cattle. These are animals that are sold for breeding purposes. We buy our breeding animals from that. We mostly sell it for meat purposes. So there's a meat market we try to target. And they have the biggest consumption pie. Okay? So one of the markets that I see most often among us, in some cases, on the farm, they come back to your place and buy it. Freeze the beef, but that's not a lot of sales. They buy your pet and they take it to the meat factory. And you get a pretty good piece of money for that. But you cut it out there and then go into the store. Stock guys probably the most popular, but it gives you the least amount of money. Some cases when they look at the stock yard, they go to what's called background. So when they lean that cave, I'm used to taking my cave off the mother and take it back to the stock yard. Trying to ball and everything. And they can't even do it too good. They call those high risk cattle. So when a farmer buys them, the meat factory don't buy them, he's got best in the middle of his because he do not know how they will handle it. He got them for that. If he knows you're doing certain things, you go to a special sale, you need a different price. We did not it. And we're trying to move that what the big people want, a semi-load for the cattle. Enough for 50,000 pounds. Now normally for the people I work with, small farmers, no one person can do that. But if we can agree on how to do this together, we can make that happen. But in some cases, it means we have to do some things better too. So improve what they weigh in weaning, seven to nine months, not all year. How fast are they growing? Two pounds a day or more. What if is the carcass grade? We're going to do some, some training on that. They really want to use about seven or nine grades of meat. The topic is prime, choice, and select. 
If you don't make those, it goes to hamburgers, soup, bologna. It's got to cook us meat. It's the same thing. But the meat breaks differently. We want ours to be steak quality. Prime, choice of select. It's about the marbling or the fat in the muscle. If the fat is in the muscle, they make it soup. Camels are like it. They make some, 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 uh, some chicken hot dogs, some beef like They'll love it. But not, not, not longhorn. We want to satisfy longhorn for our cattle. It's the same way. It may be some different practices, but the chain is different. We work on the chain. In some cases, we need to look at quantity. I'm talking about a little bit. And where do we get our heifers for the future? These are ones that are because they don't do real well. Get rid of mom and her baby. Don't need one of them to stay here. Now remember that we can eat all of them. Only certain of us that deserve to be on the promise in the year. Remember, they all taste the same. And rivers, stay, barbecue, they all taste the same. But the breed is a different demand for them. Don't like the way they look. Like what they do. That's what we want to do for. So this is the beef cattle industry we're part of. I don't want to call it beef cattle, I don't call it beef industry. Let's look at each animal as a product somebody's going to eat. And that's what change how we do them. So it says out what we call a cow can. You know they have a bull. They can breed up to 25 cows in a group. So you don't need a bunch of bulls. One bull for 25 cows. They're going to mild strength about nine months. She drops that baby. It's going to stay with her. We're going to stay between seven and nine months. When it comes off the model, it can be anywhere between 400 and 650 pounds. If the baby weighs 450 pounds, 400 pounds in seven months, you got some money. If it's 650, somebody will buy your soup. You got something to do. Don't let it go for meat all the time. When they leave this cow can, it goes to the stock yard. There's a middle man in here. And we take it to a stock yard, and they buy these scales. They go to what's called a feed the stock yard. They get those animals adjusted, talk to me and what's real. Learn how to drink from a water trough. Get vaccinated, get the word. And they carry it from this mean way here, wherever that was, up to about seven feet, and they get sold again. <coughs> they go to another stock car possibly, and the first thing was to finish them. He's going to do what we call fat. He's going to buy it. And he's going to buy that animal, put it on a lot of feet, get it as fast as he can, no about 120 days. He's got to get it from 750 to 1300 pounds. Now remember, when he does this, he don't even know who this person is. It could be you or me. He's going to judge for how they can look. He's going to judge the breed in them and their traits by their color pattern. You're going to look at that good. And when they leave there, they get graded, they get processed, inspected. They don't want to say kill them, especially if you get kids in there. Let's use the word harvest. And that's how we we harvest those cattle. We still do the same thing. Some of them go back to the farm and we But we don't want the kids to get there. Okay? So harvest, I can do grapes. And we look at the carcass to determine how the quality of the product. And this is determine how much money we get back here. So wholesale cuts, they buy that carcass, cut it up, retail, once it deals with us, they add value to it. So this is what the feeder cat market was. It's what they buy for. They buy these from long ago, for example. They want these steaks by the meat, the plates. And on that same plate, they want a 12 inch rib pie. For me, I want some mashed potatoes and corn on that same plate. If it doesn't fit that way, if it gets real big, like a walking horse, they die. If it's real little, like a coffee cup, they're going to die. It's got to look a certain way. If you do that for you, you get the best money. Not the biggest. Not the little dinky little thing. The one that just, and we got to know what that is. If we're not doing it, we got to go measure it. Make sure we got it in our bulls, and it'll be in our head. They want them to be processed, and they're going to be, they want them to have, there's a muscle score they get. We're going to look at that. I don't have to do that to cover you today. But this is what they judge on the beef yard. They, when they walk in the side yards, they, they calculate the muscle score. It goes from one to three. One is very heavy muscle, three is flat like a jerry cat. And they really want 1.5. And some breeds give you that more than I'm going to do that in a minute. They look at how tall they are, frame score. Normally it's medium to large. These numbers go from one to nine. One, two, and three is short squat. Four, five, six is medium. Seven, eight, and nine is large. They want a medium to large. I'm in the cattle association, so I've got some video we'll look at today. Really from George, but you can do the same thing. Go we'll look at your market report. Get somebody here from South Carolina, uh, somebody in the economics, and look at the price of those cans, what they're looking for. And whatever they want, you buy your bull, you should have got that. If the bull is cheap, and he's a friend for three, he's not cheap, that's all he's worth. But one thing bad about a bad bull, he's going to harm what? 25 different kids. When a bull's doing real good, he has 25 kids. A good cow will have one cat a year. I mean, keep my bull three years, you see the bring it to one half? So to buy a good bull, you have to spend the money for three cows for three hours. They ain't the same. A good bull will carry you places. 
If when they slaughter this animal, somewhere around 12, 300 pounds, when they dress them out, given the organs, the hide, the skin, the head, the bone, the legs, they want to wear somewhere about 60 to 70 pounds. They want that red body muscle across the back, long and wide, it would be a 12 inch red body. You miss out bulls, especially ants. If they're, if they're not good at this, they won't miss you. Then what you know, they're ashamed of their people. When they're proud of it, and you buy the bull, you go to these bull sales, they will have to be in there because they know it's going to make you money. But only the one that reads it are going to know about it. Oh, you're going to get a bull with you, so why it's so cheap? He had 10 inch beer bottles. Because you don't know what those damn That's all it was worth. You said they had different things, but they didn't get no They took advantage of you. They'll sell you something that will not be worth much in the future. You're going the wrong direction. You see what we're going? We're paying the wrong stuff because of the price. We got to find a way to get better quality and not hurt. And then they want to break the meat. Remember, I mentioned the top two choices. This is probably over what you think. We don't see much of that. But the big demand is this in choice. You know, we worry about high blood pressure struggles to come with animal fat. We don't want all that fat on it, but we want the fat in the muscle. When the fat is real little like this, barely making it, that's okay. It's a cheap steak. If I'm taking a woman out, my wife, and I want to marry, I'm not married. I'm going to business sales, prime steaks. I'm not sure about her. I know she got a man on the side. I'm going to buy some steak. <laughs> so we can decide on we want animals to keep them out of this time. So let's keep going. I think many things are important. There's another discussion on that. Keep records of what they're doing. So we don't let my mind. If you got five guys, you can do it. If you got 15, 20 guys, we got to start writing that down some kind of way. And the older that's kind of we go in data that's going to make me money. The data got to make me money. Let me take the money now. Identify who it is, who the parents, how well they reproduce in the care. What you've done to them for hurting them? Are they easy keepers? Do I need to vaccinate them? Do I have the parents that problem all the time? What am I feeding for my program? Are they grazing? How long are they grazing? What are they grazing? Am I feeding hay? Am I feeding beds to feed? Am I buying it? Am I raising it? Find out what they cost you. And then that's all this is done. Now I'm talking about reproduction. The animals do this instinct, just let them live their But you gotta handle this other part. So when do you agree? Nine months pregnancy? When they gonna care? How long does the bull stay in there? One bull for 25 cows? We don't need a lot of bulls. One bull can handle 20 cows. If I got 40 cows, I'm making two bulls. But just keep rotating. You make sure I know what it's doing. And then selection couple, because like I'm doing my tasks. I'm going to decide who's going to be in my farm next year, and who's going to be available for, the, for Thanksgiving dinner. Okay? So the top third is the herd only. I'll sell my friends my middle third. But the bottom third is going to the stockyard. Whatever they're doing this year, don't hold on to get better next year. You, you had your chance. I got a property with six houses in it. Six apartments in it. First name being a rent, you can't get a cheap deal, no chance. The bank said you can't, you'll be able. You can go get that person. The guy's the same way. If they eat grass in your farm, if they inside your fence, and if they, if they break out the fence, you can't go get it. The guy's gonna do better than that. If she jump out the fence and she got a big cat, I kiss her. She jump out, she got a bad cat, she's gonna try to get out of here. You wouldn't do that again in my fence. I can't get out there no more. I just can get out there, throw cats down. Don't smell the bay in the bar. All day Friday. Back and sore. Wait till Saturday morning. I'm ready to go again. I do it today. I'm still sore next week. I don't need all that work. And if I look around in here, most of us don't need it either. We don't want no hard to keep that. They're not just that good. They don't make us more money by being difficult. They give us headaches. They make me cut off more of my hair. Uh uh, don't do that. We gotta get out of that kind of stuff. So let's keep going. Breeds sometimes identify their performance. English breeds, Angus and Herford, for the most part, think about English, they're those small babies, 50 to 65, 75 pound birth weight. They're mean and frame, but they're known for this right here high carcass quality. When people see black in their head, they don't even know where they come from. They expect they're going to get a better breed of meat. They firmly breed much faster in life, you got to be careful, and they don't have horns. We're going to talk about the horns for animals later. When their head is full of funny like that, they, they horn all the babies. Oh, well, you can't talk with a baby, you get horns. But they don't have to cut the horns off. That, that feed is talking about talking about, he got to cut the horns off. He got no cancer, you don't do it. When you do those kind of things, he's getting you in your pocket. The big breeds, Charlotte, they look like a big breed. It's weightless. And they ain't even care if Charlotte, some of them, they got black, they got black, some of them. But they're born big, your gals can have, you don't have thousands of cows. Don't so breed them in your pocket, you pull them in your pocket. You be calling them in here about 4 6 You lose your money, go fast. They're fast, they got large frame. They weigh heavy carcass and they grow real fast. But they take late to get mature and they grow and they have a difficulty with their birth. Beef master, ear cattle, so brainless beef master, they can tolerate heat and insects a little bit better. 
But let me talk about this. I want to talk about some feed. This is, and I need you to understand what's going on. If we're spending money on feed the bed, you can get out of, out of the pipe. Remember talking about that dollar pound. I'm trying to listen to you. Say, if feed costs a ton is 2,000 pounds, that means it's 40 bags in that, 50 pound bags. If you're spending $40 a ton of feed, that's 10,000 bags, you're spending 20 cents a pound. On the other hand, if I'm spending 800,000 tons of feed, that's a 20,000 bag, it costs me 40 cents. Normally speaking, a can would eat about seven pounds of feed to pick up one pound of weight. Let's go to this cheaper. If I'm spending 20 cents a pound on the feed, and eat seven, seven pounds of that, it costs me $1.40 to put that on the feed. So I take the care to the stock yard, and bring me back one forty six. I can keep giving the feed. If the feed costs me $600 a ton, $30 a pound, that costs me $2.10 a pound, I take it to the stock yard, it costs me one forty six. Put that feed back in my pocket. See what I'm doing now? I'm spending $2.10 to make a dollar for you. You're going backwards. So we gotta go look at that. Then the price of cattle change. When cattle prices look good, show the feed to them. If it ain't looking good, take your wife out to the make it out into another place. Okay? It's the same with the feed. This is the thing with that influence of cattle prices. I, I looked at this. If you took a calf and it was a steer, I castrated it. Or a bull, I didn't cut it on heifers. It was this price, but I looked at this in Georgia. A steer. And this is about 500 pound cake. We sold this for the 25 years of the farm. If a steer weighed 500 pounds, he brought a dollar 46 to sell pound. If you didn't cut it, they gave you a dollar 46. And the heifer, you had no choice in that, they gave you 125. So by you cash it, it cost you six cents per pound, or you lost $30. And that's what we And that's what we Much like that, how many you get? 25 years? You see what your money's going? You can hire some kids, but that's what you've been somebody did. Because you can call a bed there, but you gotta find out where to sit. But that way, about five. That's for him now. You can dock $30,000 in that game. That's what they say. Heifers, almost $100 different because of the gym. This is the frame size. I'll talk to you. A medium to long, medium to tall frame animal, 146. When they were medium, more like a five, they brought 140. When they were short, this muscle score, they brought 125. So just by the sake of this muscle store, they got them 40 cents a pound. So about another 30 dollars a head. So imagine this. I don't cash me. I got a thin muscle bull. I'm losing how much money per year? 60 dollars per head. Multiple that for 25 head, I can take my wife to the bank. Okay? Otherwise, I'm getting mutual tired. But then we're going to make down for an anniversary, and she's mad. Because I didn't do these little things. I didn't find small frame stores. They said it's too little now. They didn't mean it now. But you still sell small cattle? You ask the dead cattle, but this is what you do. Those issues are being sensitive. So, medical practices, disease will hear about that the hornet, cash rates are going to be one thing I think is important. So, we want to make sure that I'm dead We don't want to hear the wrong breeding. If it does impact their behavior, the meat quality is improved, and the price is better. The idea I want to say here is that in some cases we can add value to the animals that we have by winning those calves that we call these back ones. Keep it in your farm for about 45 days, keep it somewhere. Separate it from the mother, let it get used to a trough and no milk. You shouldn't have passed any worm, cash it in the horn and heal, and then go to special sale. They get about 40 to 50 cents more per cow. We want to talk about it. And this will be doing it in Fort Ballard, and this is what we want to talk about. And we'll stop right here. It's a small farm on Linus. Anybody's got a small farm? But we try to agree on something. It may be the whole herd. People stuff there, so we're doing about we're trying to do a truck. Work. Okay? We got we do we agreed on the management, we agree on we agree on our marketing plan. We got seven agreed, we'll do about five bulls, about ten thousand dollars each, about fifty thousand dollars a book. We agree with them. I visit their farm, we visit the sales, we visit the bulls we want, and we put a cap on where we want, we want to stay. And we went after the bulls, we went there and said among them. We don't want people to look like us today, but we were smiling when we got the bull out of it. So we want bulls with similar breeds. Because the cows are buried. We want to breed it at a certain time. We bred in April. We expect the fish to come in January. We're going to pull them off in September. And we hope to get a truck going out in October. So we're looking for a different price by that time. So this is my summary. Cash rate and cash is an investment. You got to do that if you're trying to make more money. Consider prices when using feed to either give it to your cash or to the markets. So let's do it for the right trade. That's how they look. Growth, how tall you are, and the muscle because it makes you money. And build your herd, select them based on how fast they grow. 
So they multiple market options for the start got being the lowest. The one that kept that to do with it, take it to the start game. But with extra work, you get higher price for the year. Thank you. Am I through there? Can I get a few questions? Anybody got any questions? Give me a sense of your challenges. That's why we didn't go here. We want to be able to talk about problem solving. The more I can hear from you, the better we're going to do it for Valley and South Carolina State these days. Yes. And, and you can do when you, when you start to know and understand it, you can record it. Tell us who you are, what you got, so we can get a sense of scale. Yes. My name is James Loudon. Um, I'm a cloud cat operator. Um, mainly focused in the area of commercial cattle. Uh, but I also have some registered uh, Angus cattle as well. Uh, what I've tried to do over the years is to continue to increase uh, profitability by uh, using a better bull uh, and taking the time to do that. Uh, for me, some years ago, I, I have dabbled in uh, artificial insemination because that's a way to kind of get it. Right? <laughs> a great bull for a low cost, but, but all of that. Uh, but I think one of the, I want to thank you for bringing up uh, the situation that we have to do more uh, to help our cattle. And it's not that much more to do, but if you got a calf and you can put it behind a telegram code, that's the wrong one. You've got to change operations so that uh, the quicker you can get that uh, that nine month, that six month calf over that five hundred range, the better off the commercial producer is. But I think one, one about downfalls, one of the things that I've struggled with is trying to get a lot of small farms. That's been a great challenge. Uh, and I don't know what to do. I think we got to work together on things like that. Because I work with different groups, and we're going to be talking to the doctors and the rest of them to see how we can bring folks in together. Even USA has some places to help us out. So, guys, and then we can get money from sources to help implement certain things. So field day, this is really talking. We didn't do some things. So getting it, seeing it, being there, I think we're gonna make some big steps towards that kind of way. Any other questions? Anybody? Challenges on your problem you want us to know about? Because one thing about that survey, we didn't know who you are. And we got a list. We're gonna get you up with you again and tell your friends. Anything that you want to hear more about, put it on there. If we don't hear from you, we make this up sitting in the conference room. That's the way to find out. I need to hear from you what you want to hear more about. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Tell me about yourself. Can you start? I'm William Watts. Um, just a small cow operation. Very good. That just do good. That's good. Um, a lot of the problems of, you know, you go take the cow to some quick stop job or whatever. You ain't kidding. Did um, you see those factors that you showed you? Breed, size, condition score. You know, all of them for not the price. They can wait to sell if we don't do those things, they get this for a reason. You never know when they get it. You don't know what it's talking about. We gotta work all those problems out. We could we could have another fit that we can see cattle that's properly fit and those that need some work. Because when you take it to the start now, that's a summary problem seven and nine months of work. It ain't that day. It's what you haven't done for seven and nine months. Oh, I don't expect it to change that day. So we're gonna talk about it. so we don't understand what that looks like and what you gotta do to get it done. All right? I'll be around a little bit. And I need to hear from you, but appreciate you. Thank you. He covered a lot of bases of bases about new cow production. And our next presenter, if you've been an attendee of South Carolina State uh, programs in the past, the name may be familiar to you. Uh, Dr. Patty Sharko has worked with us on uh, different programs in the past. And uh, her presentation today is she's going to give us an update on different cattle diseases. So, Dr. Sharko, thank you. Good morning. Can you, can, you, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me great? I, I greatly appreciate South Carolina State University working together to provide this workshop. And I also appreciate um, being able to speak to you virtually um, from Columbia, South Carolina. 
And I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. So, yes, Dr. Iridasi and Dr. McGarrett were working on trying to. All of those are so important, and I appreciate that he brought those up. I thought I would bring up um, the, the cattle disease update um, information on there. Uh, I'm based at, in Columbia. There are several of us uh, veterinarians, uh, including the South Carolina State Veterinarian. Um, are housed at 500 Clemson Road, including the Veterinary Diagnostic Center. Um, and so we just uh, welcome being able to talk to producers about diseases that our diagnostic center is, uh, is seeing and different things. Um, and this is sort of a one slide that just shares a lot of the components for the diagnostic center. Uh, as far as pathology, um, and especially for necropsy. So necropsy is, is similar to autopsy in people, and this is bringing your animal, whether it's an aborted fetus or in a 2,000 or more pound uh, bull, uh, in the horses. They have all kinds of different species come in, but they, they take that animal and use histology to look under the microscope at the tissues, and then um, microbiology to look at what bacteria might be causing the problem, uh, serology to look for disease exposure, and, and certainly molecular diagnostics is on the to help us quickly diagnose diseases. When I started working on this talk, I was looking at uh, how long it takes to um, get to Columbia from Greenwood. So I used to be where you are currently. Um, and, and found out that it's an hour and 44 minutes. Uh, just, I wanted to, so it's 91 miles and uh, a necropsy here for a food animal, um, cattle, sheep, goats, um, chickens that are used for, for food are, is $90. And if you are losing multiple animals um, within a few days, uh, they put it all under one, one session on there. But then I thought, surely you're closer to Athens, Georgia, uh, maybe. And then I found out you're simply halfway between uh, Athens and Columbia. And then I looked up because I knew that University of Georgia had increased out of state in necropsy, and it is $206 um, on there. They offer the same that we offer, plus maybe a few more molecular diagnostic tests, but we have a new molecular. Uh, specialist uh, joining in the next couple of weeks, and we hope to be able to be operating the more PCRs on there. So, you know, with the diagnostic center, that is where one of the components. And the uh, next one is the animal health programs, and that's the section I'm in. And I just, you know, we're supposed to monitor health, identification, and movement of all livestock coming in or leaving South Carolina, including some permanent, which would be their auction markets in, in different areas, uh, flea markets, coordinate statewide animal emergency response, and provide veterinary expertise for extension livestock teams. So that, that's why I'm here. We also have the state meat and poultry inspection uh, component, but today I'm going to get into more of the animal health programs. So this is from um, the Census of Agriculture for the different uh, food animals that we have, or land horses, livestock, that we have in South Carolina. And, and certainly in the upstate, we were much more concentrated on um, animals uh, for, for a lot of the different species. I wanted to just bring up uh, what recent cases have we seen at Clemson Veterinary Diagnostic Center. Um, 
what are the ones? And then the first one I just wanted to say is recent is within the last six months. And in January and February, we had quite a few salmonella cases, deaths um, in beef cattle uh, occur. Uh, most of these cases were coming more from the Low Country PD area um, on there, but it was a surprise um, and, and certainly um, sudden death found found dead on there. We have had a case of Doni's disease, um, and, and I'm not going to get into each of these diseases unless you have questions at the end um, that you'd like to learn a little bit more about it. But Doni's disease is caused by bacteria the animals waste away that usually at two years old or older, which is going to be three, four, five years old. They waste away, they get diarrhea, and um, this is not a good disease. I want to keep this off the farm. So listen to Dr. Jasmine Davis about biosecurity, um, because this is one disease we don't like diagnosing. Um, but, but it's important to know that we have the bacteria in the animals on there. Um, a recent case of uh, BLV, bovine leukosis virus, this is uh, causes uh, lymphoma. Um, problems in a, a cow, beef cow came in, um, and then some of the tests of salmonella um, farms that were setting up were BLD positive. Um, once again, that's a disease we prefer to keep off the farm um, on there. And then another one that we haven't seen recently, but it does show up uh, consistently during the year, uh, BBD, bone virus diarrhea. And, and this one is one we can vaccinate for. I think it's really important to um, to to include. And the cow, cow heifers on the left are from uh, my time in, with the University of Kentucky. Uh, and this was a case that I was able to get out and take pictures of these heifers. But these heifers are BBD persistently infected. They um, they were exposed while they were being formed in the uterus uh, in a certain period of time uh, during gestation. And they have, so the cow got exposed, but she got let you get a cold, you got the virus, and then um, these got exposed. And you're born in their urine, their feces, there's their mucus, saliva. If they have saliva, it's not too many. That is just teaming with the different viruses. So once again, vaccination is very good to help protect this disease. So I have to add, what if your cow had, and this is looking at um, slaughtering uh, beef, animal beef uh, cross dairy. Um, on the left, uh, she's got teeth lesions on the, on the bottom, and she's got on her feet, she's got allergens or um, they were vesicles and they broke open on there. So she's you find her slaughtering and laying, and you see multiple cattle. And this is a big red flag that we hope we never see um, because this is FMD, uh, foot and mouth disease, uh, that is in other countries but not the United States. But what would you do? I just want to remind you anytime you have cattle with different clinical signs, you know, they found dead, do a necropsy, please. I, I, there are over 200 reasons cattle can be found dead. So help, let the necropsy help try to rule out some of the important ones that we can prevent. Um, but, you know, abnormal clinical signs and suspicious activity, please call our office, the state veterinarian, or at your very neat Dr. Jasmine Davis. She represents U.S. Department of Agriculture Veterinary Services. But we contact the area of veterinary in charge, which is Dr. Tawana Vineyard. And certainly, if you have suspicious activity, call the law enforcement. So we had some cattle in Lexington die, several died, and if they said that the local neighbor had poisoned them. Uh, it ended up, so they called law enforcement, they called us, they brought the cow in one of the recent cases to the lab for necropsy. It ended up being nitrotoxicity from the hay. So the hay was tested, and uh, they have been feeding the hay all along, but literally the next to last bale was just loaded with nitrate. It was killing the cow on there. But why do we want to do this? Because of early detection, and then also um, just make sure planes are in place. But early detection is super important. Uh, we would prefer you to call one of us um, than, than not call. So then I started thinking about what diseases 
you can have. And I don't know if you consider ticks a disease, but they certainly can carry diseases. But I wanted to mention about a tick that arrived in the United States in 2019. On there, 2017, I'm sorry. But uh, North Carolina shared a case that they had in Surrey County. Um, so North Carolina Department of Agriculture had a case in 2019. And I did not know where Surrey County is. So this map shows you that Surrey County is up there, right against the Virginia border at, at Mount Airy um, on there. So it's away from South Carolina. But just wanted to share. And this is just showing these little ticks that are just uh, all over the and, and literally they are sucking blood out. They could potentially get diseases, but these actually killed the cattle because there were so many of them on the cattle. This is the original one that was found in New Jersey in 2017 in a sheep. These ticks look a little bit bigger. It probably is because of the magnification, but these, these are little ticks. So let's just look at um, information that is available on you know, CDC, uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, but this is showing one of the little hints on somebody's fingertip and just showing how small they are and then they go through the different stage. And really, they're supposed to be the size of a pea uh, is when they get full. So this is this is the current map at, that is online that was in May. Um, and you can see that it has the two places in South Carolina. So I wanted to give you a heads up that, you know, we do get ticks on cattle. I just want you to keep your eyes open for numerous ticks and about sampling. We'll talk about that in just um, a minute uh, or two. But uh, this is just showing that there were two cases in South Carolina. Um, one up below Charlotte, and then one in uh, Greenville, Spartanburg area. And these were Humane Society dogs uh, that University of South Carolina School of Public Health was doing a monitoring, and they found the long horned tick on um, a dog in each of these places on there. That's all we've seen. This, this, this one is just showing that Virginia has had the most counties involved with cases. Um, on there, and South Carolina certainly has the two counties where the dogs were, um, were found. So, just to let you know that this, this tick should not be in the United States, but it is. And, and so it's been confirmed in a number of states, um, including South Carolina, and it's been found infesting sheep, goats, dogs, cats, horses, cattle, chickens, foxes, coyotes, white-tailed deer, elk, Opossums, raccoons, Canada geese, red-tailed hawks, and humans. I just wanted to go through that. You know, we're seeing it on multiple species um, on there. What is so unique about this tick is the female can reproduce without a male. So a single tick on an animal coming onto a farm or location can create a population in, in that location. Um, Pretty, pretty scary on there. And then, as we found, severe infestation can cause blood loss or anemia and death. So, the lung tick in other countries does carry other diseases. Um, one disease was diagnosed only in one farm in Virginia cattle and has not been diagnosed in, in any of the other ones. But, um, but it's a fact about ticks. So, let me just do a reminder, it is the season for tick season. So let's just go through what CDC said. And I know this is supposed to be cattle disease update, but you know, people in, in animals uh, just use fine tip tweezers. And if you don't have that, use your fingers with a tissue paper, and they recommend a foil gum covered gum wrapper or a plastic sandwich bag. The grass, the tick as close to the skin as possible. Pulling upward and steady. Do not twist, okay? And don't use hot matches to pull in jelly. Um, I was I was taught to use hot matches and uh, alcohol. Uh, they say don't do that because they actually may vomit and, and potentially create uh, more chance of disease into you. 
So, of course, after removing the tick, wash the area with soap and water, disinfect it, and put the tick in a Ziploc bag, um, and then give that bag to its. Now, this is what CDC says to your veterinarian or doctor for examination. But if you think it might be a long term tick, um, please contact uh, either our office here at Clemson Livestock Poultry Health or the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, and Services. And Dr. Jasmine Davis will be contact for you. So this is from the point out. This is a good photo just showing um, uh, where those um, ticks are. And having had a tick just a, a couple years ago, having been in the forest, they I found one in my groin area. I no nowhere else on there, but one mm -hmm. one tick found its way up. But what it's showing on the left, I'm going to magnify it a little bit more. Is you know don't have the, the wide tipped um, forceps use narrow tipped and try to get as close to the head and, and the attachment as possible. Um, we just don't want those animals to be squeezed and hurt the major contents. All right, so that was a quick tick to uh, coverage on there. Uh, a lot of my time is spent talking to producers about nutrition um, on there. And I just want to mention water is <coughs> the most important nutrition component that cattle consume and animals and humans. Okay, then energy, um, and then protein, and, and then sort of last is minerals. Um, on there. If you look at the cattle on the left, this was a farm in the Aiken County area that had lost a number of cows. Um, and when they came to us, they were extremely skinny, uh, emaciated um, on there. And they were older cows that with worms, and usually older cows we don't see with worms um, on there. And, and so we um, diagnose not only the worms, but we actually have trace mineral uh, deficiency of copper and cobalt. I spent a lot of time talking to these producers who have got cattle and especially goats about the importance of making sure that they have an excellent source of copper um, in a loose mineral and not a good cobalt. But the number one component is water for nutrition. This is looking at a, a stock for backgrounder in Kentucky. Um, and looking at uh, the water that they need to drink, full of algae. Um, yeah, you know, we want it as clean and clear as possible, but this, you know, this heat that we have, it's hard, hard to do that. But it's important to um, have clean water. And one of the things, not necessarily in the fat, but is uh, blue green algae. And this uh, cyanobacteria that's in the blue green algae uh, is going to be coming up in the late summer with the, the heat and, and dryness that we have, stagnant water. There are lots of toxins that can cause acute death, uh, cause the liver problems, uh, can cause neurotoxins, so like muscle tremors and convulsion. And then when they don't get much, but it affects the liver, they'll get what we call photosensitization, where the white areas literally our like sunburn on there. So we want to keep them away from this because it is um, hard to treat them. I was trained with blue-green algae. It's, it's usually going to be a shimmery green um, on there. So these are some pictures that I was able to get um, uh, from Google images. But uh, the one on the right uh, is sort of what I had always been described. But I'm learning that we don't know um, which, which one has blue green algae or not. But probably keep the cattle off of this. They shouldn't be drinking um, from this. Uh, just in the last week, American Veterinary Medical Association um, provided a um, study talking about how many animals, primarily small animals, have died, dogs, from um, the blue green algae. So it's just, it can kill. Um, and all kinds of animals, and we just try to keep cattle away from areas that have algae on it and keep the waters clean when you can. After this, I just have to say don't track it back. And I have to look at how I'm doing on time, but don't track it back. And this is my, my one biosecurity slide to say um, so easy to bring diseases from one, one place to another. On there, so don't track it back. And now I'm going to step a little bit away from 
eat cattle and wondering, I wish I was right there and I could ask, how many of you have backyard pigs? Um, I'm going to assume that most of you, some of you do have backyard pigs, and I just want you to be aware of a disease that's in other countries and it's on the rise. So we're very scared about it occurring in the United States. But this is African swine on there. Just a quick one that, you know, this is not a human health risk, it's pigs only. But you know, we also are concerned about are going to be, um, is not a human health risk, is not a food risk, uh, but that, you know, foot and mouth can do cattle, sheep, goats, um, and pigs. But that is one thing with just those pigs, it does have a high, could have a high death rate, and we are very afraid of bringing in imported swine. But look at that last one survivability in meat, more than 140 days in salted, dry hands and years in frozen purposes. So this virus is very hardy and, and definitely hot in several areas, including um, Africa, you know, Middle East, and Europe, and Eurasia on there. Um, it is currently not the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and a lot of other countries, too. You can see the blue areas on the map on the right are the, the animals, I'm uh, sorry, the countries that, that have the, the, the disease on the earth. And then OIE, which is, uh, it's in, that's French, and it means World Animal Health Organization, uh, shared this just recently. So the, the I guess you call it double orange line, um, is the wild peaks, feral peaks, and, and the green line is domestic peaks. But um, it, it has been devastating to, um, especially to China. Uh, it hit Vietnam um, and Europe, and of course Denmark with their special hands are trying to keep it out of their country. We've got a lot of feral peaks in South Carolina, so all I can say is heads up on this particular disease. So what are you going to do as far as um, when you see abnormal clinical signs? Please call, call either our office, the state veterinarian's office, the, the area veterinarian in charge here in South Carolina. And if you think it's suspicious, uh, call the law enforcement on there. So I really appreciate having 20 minutes to be able to present to this group. And uh, esteemed group, I just appreciate having a number of wonderful speakers on just being part of the group. Questions. Okay, okay. We have to go to the microphone. Dr. Shackle, this is Josh. Yes. Yeah, yeah uh, I talked earlier about the ticks. Getting all going to kill. How is that relationship? Can 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 deer stick affect our animals? I apologize. I'm having problems hearing the full question. Okay, let me go slowly. Ticks. You remember ticks? Yes. Okay, from deers. Can they cause uh, diseases on cattle or sheep? I mean, the ticks can carry anaphylaxis, which we have here in South Carolina. So yes, and, and so they could carry it. But from the wildlife, I mean, yes, anytime a tick goes from from one animal that has a disease and carries it to the other, it can happen. I think this longhorn tick is, it can carry disease, but the biggest concern is it just multiplies on its own and, and it can overwhelm the animal when uh, taking too much blood away from it. 
I'm sorry if that didn't answer your question. No, 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 it did, it did. Another question, and, and perhaps there's somebody who's coming. Absolutely. Uh, you say earlier there was some disease you couldn't explain uh, because of timing. We do have a lot of time for explaining one or two diseases if you could. Which one could you select that is really causing harm this year? Each of those, so I like salmonella, gummy disease, um, bubonic necrosis, and BVD. Um, I would say consistently BVD is bubonic viral diarrhea, and, and as Dr. Dean Noble um, mentioned about vaccination, it's one of our you know, four viruses, IPR, PI3, BVD, and CBRC. At least it's our top with our three um, that we want to vaccinate. It vaccinates and protects against reproduction. Problems and then also respiratory disease. Um, there are, uh, the virus diarrhea is is just um, oh my gosh, it, 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 our, our COVID is reminding me so much of the PVD um, um, as far as just uh, fairly infectious. And, and if you have the cattle that go into a trailer and they definitely on, on the trailer. That manure can carry keep the virus. It doesn't multiply, but the virus can stay alive for at least seven days. So if you don't disinfect the trailer with any groups of cattle that might have to be, and especially pregnant animals, early pregnant is what I worry about. Um, from about 30 to days to about 150 days, um, is where that if that cow, if that pregnant cow or pregnant heifer gets exposed to the virus. Um, then they, they, they expose the fetus, and, and that's where we get persistently infected cattle being born. And in the case that I showed you, the heifers that were pre positive, they, they were trying to keep those away from the pregnant cattle. They, they, they were no hazard for the meat consumption, and so they were being raised as far as possible. They had broken out twice and gotten close to the pregnant animals. Um, and so it just, it's a tough one because they're, they're a walking time bomb all the time. Um, and, and if you saw them, they looked nice and fat and sassy, but the farm had lost probably um, 20 stores or portions, um, and then those were the ones that survived and didn't have a virus in them. So I, I would say BBD is not on my list, and it's just an important vaccine to use. In, um, especially our super Yeah, the last one. Yeah. yeah, when we have a lot of rain, do we have but a lot of uh, uh, the status outbreak or is when we have some Extreme Is this in, in beef cattle or, or in dairy? Dairy, dairy, dairy. Dairy, okay. Yeah, I just, anytime I hear about mastitis in beef cattle, beef cattle did mastitis in one day, it's dairy cattle do. Um, they tend not to show the whole lot of the brain negative ones. Yeah, they don't get that as much, but anytime I hear about it in beef cattle, I didn't say dairy, but I just have to get on my little bandwagon about making sure proper selenium and zinc are, are, are good in the middle that they're getting every day. Just because I, I see, I've seen in Kentucky mastitis, especially like pepper mastitis, and for a little bit of um, uh, on there. But with dairy cattle, it's just trying to um, remove the bacteria off the teeth um, and, and smear the teeth with uh, post post-milking uh, teeth disinfectant um, on there, and then fly control. As soon as it gets hot, the flies go to the bottom and they start feeding and, and taking the wheels off of the teeth and, and causing problems and irritation, and then that can be your mass too. I don't know, do you have some comments on that? Thank you, Dr. Sharko, for that presentation. And our next presenter uh, today is uh, Dr. Jerry.
Okay. And is there any sheep and goat producers? One. Okay. And how about I found the idea of how we can do that for these images. So for our people who have been producing for about a year or less, can you raise your hand? Okay. About a year to five years. Okay. Five to ten. Okay. More than ten? Okay, so we have some season producers in here. That's good to know. That's good to know. Alright, so to read that off of Dr. Noble's presentation, he was talking about power management. Um, I just want to remind you guys you put all that work into raising these animals, into uh, getting a profit pretty much on these animals. What you don't want to do is have a disease event happen on the farm. And that's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about you guys making sure that you keep your, your farm nice and clean, make sure there's no disease event that happens to you. Okay? So, what I'm just going to talk about is what is biosecurity and surveillance. Then I'm going to talk to you guys about why are we uh, aphids concerned about certain diseases. Then I'll talk about particular programs that are focused on cattle, sheep, and goat. Then in the impact of those diseases, if there was a disease event, uh, the threats of those diseases. And then I'm going to talk about what I would do in my role as an aphid veterinarian, and then what you guys' role will be as producers. And then, towards the end, I'll kind of give you guys some principles of how to apply it to your farm. All right, sounds good? So, when you think about biosecurity, what I want you to think of is reducing and preventing animal disease to come into your farm. That's it. You want to take one measures to make sure that there's nothing that's going to come into your farm that's going to cause uh, illness in a spread. So it's not only just your farm, but just to your neighbor's farm. So when it comes to surveillance, what I want you guys to think about is protection and locating. So a good surveillance system will be able to pick up on a disease quickly. Right? So the quicker we're able to pick up on a disease, the better we're able to control it and prevent the spread. Also, this surveillance system will allow us to pretty much get the status of a disease within a population of animals. Right? So diseases that are of particular concern nationally or particular concern of the federal of the government are diseases that's going to affect human health. It could affect the environment, and it can affect a population of animals. And one of the biggest reasons is it affecting the economy. But on the level of you guys, it can affect your pockets. So just keep that in mind. Some of those diseases fit into foreign animal diseases, emerging diseases, and certain endemic diseases. Alright, so here's a list of foreign animal diseases. I'm not going to go over it because of time restraints, but this is just for your awareness. I plan on sending this out to you guys so you can have it, and if on your own time, you can look through it and do your research on it. The same for emerging diseases. So let me go back to foreign animal diseases for you guys who are unaware. Foreign animal diseases pretty much means they're not located here in the United States, right? And then emerging diseases. Here's a list of some emergency diseases based off of the role of health organization. And these diseases have either changed their character in the disease itself, or it has an increase in infection in the population of animals. Right? What I'm going to address today is more so the national diseases, the national disease programs, meaning that the diseases are here in America. Right? So uh, again, I'm going to focus on cattle and sheep and goats. So for the cattle diseases, we have the tur tuberculosis eradication program. We have the brucellosis eradication program, or you might know, know it better as Bain's, uh, Bain's disease or contagious abortion disease. Um, then you have the BSC surveillance program, which stands for bovine spongiform encephalopathy. I say that slowly. <laughs> And then you have cattle fever ticks eradication program, which Dr. Sharpo uh, kind of addressed the ticks uh, earlier. For sheep and goats, we have the scraping program. 
So tuberculosis, the reason why this is a national concern is because, again, remember I said, we're concerned about things that's going to affect humans or the environment. We're concerned about if it's going to affect the population of animals, and we're concerned about if this is going to hurt the industry. So with TB, it can affect humans. All right. It's not. It, it is something that can get transferred from the cow to a person in that respiratory disease that some of you guys may be familiar with. All right. This disease, you, you're not going to typically see it clinically. So we go out and we have to test for it. A lot of this is tested at slaughterhouses or slaughter plants, as you say. Um, but we also can come into the farm and test it if it's suspected or routinely. So usually your accredited veterinarian, your livestock vet, will come and do a test that's called a CFT, which stands for call of vote test. If they happen to get a suspect, if they're kind of worried about it, then they'll call either a trained state or a trained federal veterinarian to come out and do a follow-up follow test, which is a test on your left called a CCT, which stands for a comparative surgical tuberculin test. So if you, if we were to do this test, if the, the cow came up or sheep or goat came up positive or suspect, then you have two options. You'll either have to send the animal straight to slaughter or we'll come back in 60 days and retest it. If it's fine, then it's great, thumbs up. If it's a reactor, then it has to go to a uh, slaughter, all right? So brucellosis, this disease is also uh, a disease that can be transferred to humans. So that's another reason why we're concerned about it. This disease actually, when it gets transferred to humans, not only can it make you just feel bad, you can have fever, you can have muscle soreness, uh, you can have lethargy, feeling tired, but it can also cause men to have swollen testicles. It can also cause women to be sterile. Um, so we, we don't want that. Also, uh, Amongst other things, nervous system issues could occur as well. All right. So the most common clinical signs that you will see in these animals will be abortion, or they will have uh, weak calves. Another sign you might see is decrease in milk production. All right. So this is usually tested through the blood, and this is usually tested either on the farm with you guys, or it can be tested at the swap facility. BSC, all right. This, you guys may know this as mad cow disease, all right. It was first diagnosed in Great Britain in the mid 1980s, and it caused chaos. This disease disrupted the industry and negatively impacted their industry over there. So we definitely don't want to hear because we saw how badly it impacted them. This is not something that is infectious. It doesn't spread from the animals to humans. However, the animals that eat contaminated meat, if we eat that, then we can get it. And the disease that they say is correlated with mad cow disease is called Kutzfeldt Jacob disease, uh, or CJD, and it causes a nervous system disease. And if not all the time, it's usually fatal, right? So this is a big concern, not just nationally here in America, but globally. If we were to have a problem with that, then you will see a bunch of countries restricting our meat products, all right? So just like it'll show nervous system problems in us as humans, you'll see it in the cattle. They'll be wobbling, they, they will be erratic, um, just out of it, pretty much. Um, and I have a video here that, again, I'm going to send this PowerPoint to you guys so you guys can click on the link. You can see more into those diseases. Everything I'm saying will be in the notes section of the PowerPoint. So, you know, you know I know right now it's about pictures, but uh, there will be some further information about these diseases we're going to talk about today. Um, so, as far as how do we test for this, a lot of the cattle are tested. You can't test it on live cows, so a lot of it is tested on at the slaughter facilities. However, you do have, if you guys find uh, that your, your cattle is having some weird kind of symptoms that look like this, and suddenly it dies, and you don't know why, 
you can report it. Report to either your credit veterinarian, state veterinarian, or our office, APHIS. Right? And cattle fever takes, I'm not going to go too into detail about this because Dr. Sharpo already spoke about it, but I will let you see what the ticks look like. So on the left shows the female tick, and on the right is the male tick. If you guys see this on your cattle, do what Dr. Sharpo says, you know, the method of like taking it off, or just simply call, call your veterinarian, and then we'll figure out, you know, if this is truly one of the ticks that we're concerned about. All right, so sheep and goats. We're concerned about scraping. Scraping is not an issue because it can transfer to humans, but it's an issue because if you're raising, you know, sheep and goats, you're trying to get you know, wool fiber from them, it can affect that pretty much. So what we're trying to do is to protect the industry, make sure that you guys are able to raise these animals in a, you know, in a healthy manner where you can profit off of your, your hard work. And the way that we test for stray beef is also at slaughter uh, facilities and we'll come into your farm. If you have a uh, animal that suddenly dies, you're not sure why, or you're just curious, Calling us and us going there and testing, that's another way that we test for strike as well. All right, so when it comes to diseases, I don't want you to get focused too much on the, the, the diseases that I just mentioned because biosecurity and surveillance can, that's with any disease that comes to the farm, any infectious disease that comes to the farm, right? So some threats that to be concerned about, about bringing diseases to your farm are Imports, be concerned about visitors coming into your farm because visitors can easily track something in. Purchasing and selling livestock. If you're selling livestock, you could be transferring a, a sick cow or a, a sick uh, goat to another farm if you're not vigilant. Or you could be bringing on something that's sick to your farm. You don't want that. Tools and equipment, be concerned about that. Make sure they're clean. Uh, there was a situation in 2001 where there was an avian influenza outbreak in Minnesota, and it's, the farms were sharing equipment, so it spread that way. So think about situations like that. And then water and feed is another situation that you guys need to. Most of these things are simple; it's easy to kind of forget, but just make sure you're constantly doing this on an everyday basis. Checking your feed, checking your water, make sure it's clean. Um, and wildlife and pets, again, we spoke about ticks, we spoke about, uh, we mentioned deer, bringing ticks on, um, and all the different types of wildlife that ticks can attach, attach to. And not only that, um, I mentioned brucellosis a couple slides ago, and that is more so like an issue in the greater Yellowstone area, which is, uh, is endemic. The bison and the elk have that issue. So those farmers there are having to be more vigilant about the wildlife because they can bring that into their into their farms, right? Particularly with brucellosis. And waste is another thing that you guys need to uh, make sure it's addressed in your biosecurity plans as well. All right. So if there was an unfortunate event where there was a, a, a animal disease event, here are some of the uh, things that could happen that impact. So I spoke about human health. It, some of these diseases can actually cause us to be ill. And we don't want that for ourselves, we don't want that for our family members, our loved ones, and so on and so forth. It can obviously um, affect our animals, and if it's affecting our animals, it's gonna affect your productivity. It's going, that's your animal resource, that's your income, that's your livelihood. So we definitely wanna keep our animals healthy. And also, it can affect the market cells. We, I think we've seen images on the news before when there's a food safety issue and people are like, I don't think I want that anymore. You know, I don't want to be vegetarian you now. So there's a lot of documentaries out there that if we have an incident, it's going to blow up and people's minds can switch. And there goes uh, your, your income. Yeah. And trade, on a bigger scale, if you're trying to export out of the country, a lot of countries are not going to accept something that they see is a, particularly like BSE, a, a human a health concern. 
and whatnot, or something that's going to spread it to their country. They're not going to accept that. And then uh, taxpayers need a lot of dollars, really, because if we have a disease event happen to your farm or your neighbor's farm, uh, we'll have to bring in people like myself and others that come in and to control it and prevent the spread, and that's going to be a lot of money. Not only that, if it is certain diseases, many of them actually, if it's, it's at this point, uh, we have to depopulate. And that means we're about to get rid of all your animals. Certain diseases will cause us to do that. And again, that's going to hit your pockets. See, that's that farmer. It's going to hit your pockets. It's going to not only hit your pockets, but it's going to hit your mental and emotional health as well. Um, there's some farmers who went through certain events where their whole farm, their farm had to get depopulated, and they could not bounce back from that. And we do not want that for you guys. Right? All right, so what's my role at this, as a field aphid veterinarian when it comes to biosecurity and surveillance? So one of my roles is just to make sure that things are going correctly as far as regulation. So for, for, uh, for instance, I'll go to livestock markets and make sure that the animals are tagged appropriately. Um, if the animals are going out of state or changing ownership, they have to have an official ID. All right? And I'll speak a little bit more about that later on. We also do testing and sampling of live animals, and we also go to live animal uh, or slaughter facilities to test for animals, such as the TB that I spoke of. That's a, a test that I frequently do, or BSC is a test that I frequently do. And that's a surveillance program. We also do things like what I'm doing today education, um, educating the public and stakeholders as well as consultation. So if you guys need any help with developing your programs, feel free to reach out to me and I'll help you guys. And if there was a disease event that occurred, you know, hopefully not, uh, they will call people like myself and most others to come in and rush in, really, and control the disease and prevent the spread of it. So that would be my role when it comes to biosecurity surveillance. So you guys know, what you guys can do is create and implement a biosecurity SOP. SOP means standards of operation procedures. If you don't have one yet, I will help you out. All right. So make sure you guys create that. And again, some of those things like common sense, but it's the common sense things that sometimes you forget to do. Right. So just make sure you have that written out and that not only you, but everyone on that farm knows it. So you. Also doing a training on it would be helpful, right? Uh, another thing that you guys can do is uh, assist with surveillance for us. So by doing that, you guys uh, tagging animals with official ID is helpful because again, if we are able to locate a disease quickly and know where it comes from, we can better contain it and prevent the spread of it. Also, uh, adequate record keeping is helpful. If you guys ever see any dead animal on your farm die suddenly, or any or any animal that you're suspect of, uh, call your either your your veterinarian, the federal veterinarian. I'll give you guys my number later on, or the state veterinarian. We all pretty much work together on this. And then this is a voluntary program, the Spectrum Free Flock Certification Program, which I believe Dr. Sharpe can better explain because <laughs> she she does that very well. Um, but this is a, a surveillance program. Again, Scrape is one of those programs that we are uh, concerned about. So being a part of this program will allow us to know the, the disease status in the, uh, the state. Right? So here's the acronym. It's WCPR, which are six principles of biosecurity. Just six principles that you guys can think of. Hopefully, this helps you remember it when you're going throughout your biosecurity program on your own farms. So the W stands for wildlife control and watch for disease. The C stands for close, herd, and clean. The P stands for pest control, and the R stands for, for restricting access. Right. So starting uh, with the first W, wildlife control. So wildlife control, when you're thinking about what you need to do as far as keeping wildlife on your farm, your premise, is making sure that you guys have sound structure. Making sure that you have appropriate fencing for the wildlife that is around 
your uh, your area, and for your lock shop, making sure that the your storage units, your barns are are in good repair. So if you want to entice animals to make a little you know a little home there, make sure that you have your feed and certain things that uh, can entice animals, wildlife to come to your farm and you know have a nice little breakfast or dinner. Put that away. <laughs> Yeah, make sure everything's tight. The second W is watch for illness. Um, so don't just skim, don't just skim, but really watch and observe and see what's going on with your herd, right? And if you see something that is a little off that you're concerned about, feel free to call, again, your, your livestock veterinarian, state, or APHIS, the federal veterinarian. Because we'd rather you uh, be more concerned and need to be than something happened and it's like, oh, I didn't think it was that big a deal. Because, again, we want to make sure that nothing happens to your, your farm or anybody's farm and spreads. Right? So the next letter is C. The first uh, C is close herd. So if you can help it, try to not bring new animals to your farm. So you don't know what they're going to bring with them, right? So one way you can do that is uh, AI, artificial insemination. If you guys have questions about that, I'm sure Dr. Noble can help you with that. I've actually learned it from him <laughs> um, when I initially learned it. So uh, AI would be helpful. Um, but if you, just, if you do want to go to a livestock uh, yard, then making sure that they are of good health, you can ask before purchasing where, where are the test records. You know, making sure that it's examined or whatnot. Um, and then when you do bring a new animal to your farm, make sure that they're quarantined away from the rest for at least 30 days. At least 30 days, okay? The second C is clean. Clean everything, pretty much. Clean your tools, your equipment. Remember when I, earlier when I said uh, avian flu was an issue because people were sharing their tools and equipment? Um, you just want to be cognizant of the simple things again. Make sure your coat is clean. Make sure that anything that can be tracked into the farm is clean. Having washing stations around your farm um, is helpful. Foot baths are helpful. Booties are helpful. Uh, uh, even in areas to wash down your truck and your tractors would be helpful. And making sure that water goes away from the production site, right? And then the water and feed, very important to make sure that's clean. And then P is for pest control. So pretty much, I can go more in depth with pest control, but I want you guys to have at least a good and safe pest control program, pretty much. And um, so there's various ways that you guys can uh, go about it based on what type of pest you guys are experiencing on your farm. So, um, just making sure that you sit down and write up a good pest control program. And R. R is restricting access. Again, you don't just want anybody walking around your farm carrying anything. Uh, it shouldn't be that happy, that, that not should not be fine. It should be a little bit more strict where there's certain areas where people know to go. Um, and there should be signs up so people are aware of those things. Right? So if you don't have any signs up, if you don't have any, uh, if you don't have anything that is clear and visible, like this, this area is for this area, this area is for that area, then you know, start thinking about that and applying that to your farm. So all the things that I spoke about today, just think about, okay, what do I need to improve on? What am I missing? And what do I need to start and then applying to my farm? And then surveillance. So all of what I spoke about was more so about security. Surveillance, what you guys can, can do is make sure that the animals are properly identified. Uh, meaning official IDs, which will have a US, uh, US shield on it. Any tag that doesn't have a US shield on it is not considered an official ID. So if you have cattle that you're trying to sell that's going to go across state lines or it's changing ownership, you have to have the official ID applied. And there's different kinds because there's different manufacturing companies. So if you're wondering like, why is it so many different 
put your tags on there. It's just because there's different companies that's trying to get money. <laughs> so uh, just be uh, mindful that the U.S. Shield is what's going to consider it an official tag. And if you are a new producer, which actually doesn't seem like there's any new producers here, but if you have some friends who are trying to get into the business, then they can um, call our office and get some free tags. If the if your cow is going to uh, slaughter and you're not selling it, then you can have a back bag, which is that uh, on your left. But it has to be slaughtered within three days. All right. So for sheep and goats, the same thing. Uh, their their tags are called scrapey tags. It's the same thing as an official ID. So the scrapey tag is going to have the U.S. shield on it too. All right. It's also going to have a block ID number and the individual animal ID number on that. The tags on the bottom and the bottom left are the tags that we will provide if you are a new producer. Um, so you can call our office and we'll give you at least 100 free tags for your first time. All right. Another thing, another thing you guys can do is keep really good records. Try to report as much as possible. Um, that's not just for our benefit as far as tracing um, animals and, and, and containing disease, but it's, it's for you guys benefit as far as management overall. Right? You want to make sure that you're tracing like, any, any visitor that comes to your farm, the visitor law, uh, any mortalities that you have, make sure you document that. Any veterinary uh, visits that you have, document that. Um, the more you can get into the habit of doing that, the better and smoother it will be for you guys. And again, I, I say this over and over again, make sure you report anything that's unusual, any dead animals. You can report them to your livestock veterinarian, your state vet, and myself, the eighth veterinarian. All right? And that could be my sister here. Right. It was a pleasure getting to talk to you guys. I really appreciate I love outreach and I love community. So I'm here personally because I, I do care about you guys and I do want to connect with you guys. So feel free to speak to me afterwards. If you have any questions, if you have any questions right now, I'm glad to answer. Yeah, I've got one question. In my area, we have a lot of wild hogs. Have y'all had any problems with the wild hogs? No. Problems with producers or? Disease are you from here? Are you from um, I'm from uh, Grand Orangeburg, Banbury, Lower Country. Okay. No, I haven't heard too much about wild hog issues, but I can I can try to find out about you know what you're asking. I can get your contact information. Okay. And I can um, follow up with you. Okay. All right. I appreciate it. We we had some problems. I'm having problems. Are you wild hog? Okay, well, that's good to know. I definitely will get both of you guys. Right. Of course, in this situation out here, I'm only a few miles. Uh, we're starting to see it because of the creeks, beds, and stuff. And now, of course, they do they come in. Can I follow up on that? Can I follow up on that? Yeah, um, yes, yes, you can. You can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Oh, there's a little bit of delay. Sorry about that. Um, on there, no, and I don't know if it was answered, but definitely wild pigs, feral pigs, hay fairy, mucilosis, and pseudorabies. Quite a high prevalence of brucellosis in our wild pigs. Thank you. We in our area, we had wild pigs for a while, and we, I've been to a couple of meetings where the experts say, if you didn't have them, you worked on them. And I began to, to believe that even more and more.
Thank you, Ms. Sino, and uh, thank you all for having me here today. Uh, we are, uh, I'm working with uh, Dr. Leslie Hosfeld, who is uh, a Dean of the College of Behavioral Social and Health Sciences at Clemson, and our associate, uh, Dr. Ken Robinson, who is uh, both Extension and uh, World Economic Development in Sociology. And we are partnered with a um, travel partner at South Carolina State University, Dr. Vasi and the team to uh, work on a, a number of events over the next couple of years that are going to wrap and address stresses, stressors that are on the farm, stressors to the farm and to the farm, uh, to bring resources that are identified and are currently inaccessible, partly accessible, uh, and resources that are uh, needed uh, into the state and uh, into a network uh, that can serve our, our community. Uh, today, you know, as, as we heard reference to the pandemic, uh, and uh, we've all been impacted by it greatly, I think uh, one of the most common things that y'all have in this sphere is a lack of uh, reliable processing for your animals in order to get them to market. Uh, we just don't have the same capacity that we used to. Right? I would assume that the majority of folks here are used to attending uh, to, uh, to like North Rest and Hodges, which is now what back for you, uh, butchering, uh, other facilities in the area that can process your animals so that you have big control of the market where it goes to the USDA inspection. Uh, some of those issues are obviously going to be a long conversation with the professionals that are here today and with yourselves and your colleagues to do animals and get those to the market. Uh, in other cases, there may be legal issues with, uh, with uh, land issues and uh, with health, health issues on the farm. And those are all things that we're working with Dr. Adas and his team to identify, focus, and prioritize within the state of South Carolina. This is part of a, uh, a regional network of 15 states uh, and territories across the southeast, and a whole quadrant uh, network uh, from the USDA uh, that is coordinating uh, these different efforts from state levels to regional levels to a federal level. So our work is to facilitate that work um, and to facilitate uh, clear communications about what that work is and uh, partner with Dr. Dawson and his team uh, to deliver that uh, material to y'all and the resource of the time to organize those and deliver those. Dr. Dawson, do that for Thank you very much and have a good day. And I want to thank everyone for coming and thank everyone who played a part in putting this event on today. Uh, from uh, IT team, marketing, communication team, and uh, this is total team together. And I will remind everybody to look in the folder and please complete the evaluation form. And let us know how we did today and what we need to work on to improve future events. And at this time, Dr. Dawson will come forward and deliver our appropriate remarks. And then we will have our lunches out in the Oregon area. And uh, you're welcome to come back in and join the lunch here in fellowship. And if not, you're welcome to uh, take it home if the schedule doesn't allow. So Dr. Dawson will come and give us our appropriate remarks. Thank you.
Can we give a round of applause for Mr. Eo? Yeah, uh, Karis, this is your this is your place, it's your home place, and we really appreciate what you did to allow us to come here today. As this COVID thing is going slowly, slowly to have to disappear, you know that we'll have this type of meeting where we'll have a uh, hybrid, the field bus come together, and then we'll have the multitude, which is on um, uh, live streaming or sometimes zooming it on the web This is uh, it's our beginning, so we really appreciate you coming today, showing that kind of coming we have to deal with us. Uh, our university, our leader, the Kawai side, says greetings, and he really appreciates your involvement because, you know, we want to like to come back and we want us to enjoy the things we have before. Uh, we will give you but a lot of uh, emails because now we have the emails to tell you when we are coming back for different programs. We just want you to take the message from that, you know, things are tough for one more. Tell your neighbors who have issues with a disease or production or marketing, selling stuff. We will do a program which can help you. So we are planning a good number of Problems. And one which will be coming when we are almost done with funding is focus group. We're going to meet here in some form to talk about future problems. We want you to tell us the story. This is what we want you guys to come and tell us, teach us, train us, because these are our needs. Uh, as I said, I'm new to the program, but right now I don't feel like I'm new. I've got some uncles here, some friends now. We're going to have, uh, I think, some. Uh, future program together. Uh, last but not least is our team. If you guys apply the IT team, you know, our guys work very good to put it together. <laughs> you don't know, know them by name, but I just want you guys to be able to say who you are, and uh, you greet them a little bit. The people here so they can even them uh, Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mike Farewell. I'm the producer, director, um, and amongst a couple other things. Pleasure to meet everyone. Okay, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Maurice Mitchell. Uh, I do marketing communications here at AT My name is Andrea Butler. I'm the public relations specialist and social media manager. I'm James Smith. I'm the advocate at AT The boss. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as I said, we have some people who came from other counties to join us. We have uh, Tyrone William from Anderson, and uh, we have anybody from Extension who came from another county, 18 We have Mark Meadows from uh, Midland, that is Orient Park and Lombard, and what were the other counties? Oh, I'm in Orangeburg, Bamford, Orange County. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting two, two other people coming in two minutes, so I guess I see it when it comes, but I see them coming away. So, uh, what I, I really want us to do is I say, you are the, you are our food soldier. You are the one who are really doing the funnel, the production, and the marketing. When we meet for the focus group, we want you to come with a list of things. We want South Carolina State University to do the following for us. That way, it will help us in planning and also in grand writing. This year, we are very blessed that the USDA has so much fun coming to our program, but we are also but to compete with other schools. When you know your needs, it's very easy to put our acts together. So we will, we will ask you to, to show that interest when we ask guys to call you back for that type of view. And then, uh, as we say, uh, another program which will need you as a believer is the farm stress program. In that program, we will have some little we call them incentives. Those who are interested to be part of it, we will give them a little, you know, incentive to be with us. 
So, so show that interest to come if you want to be part of it. When we are ready to call upon that meeting, we will have you. It won't be more than two hours. We will sit together, go through some issues which you went through during COVID, and we'll see how it is. So, those are upcoming things very, very soon, and we will let you know. Now, do you have any questions, guys, before we go forward? That's good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again very much. And uh, this came out. Uh, <coughs> who came to take lessons for uh, 